Uh, the, the dispute seems to be whether the brand name Frisbee uh, certainly was in the 1957 as proved uh, by the supporting documentation. It's not reasonably subject to dispute. Uh, obviously, people have been playing with discs since the Greek, ancient Greeks, right? Discus was original Olympics, so that's, you know, you can argue it. But I'll, I will take judicial notice of this uh, fact. So. Mm. Well, yeah, right. Versus Robert Church. Church is present, his lawyers, uh, Mr. Lewis, Mr. DeGarren, and Mr. Chesnoff, all are present. And for the people, we have Mr. Miata, Mr. Milius, Mr. Billion, and examining the defendant, Mr. Lewin. Did I miss somebody? Did I miss anybody? No, I think no. I got everybody. All right, and you are, uh, you may. Uh, Mr. Durst is present. You may continue with your cross-examination of the defendant. Your Honor, the people would first ask the court to respect, uh, respectfully take judicial notice pursuant to evidence code section 452H that the Frisbee was not invented until 1957 and that the uh, game Uno was not invented until 1971. I think the Frisbee uh, more properly was uh, introduced I think commercially, the frisbee is introduced, introduced in 1957. In Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, and yes, the court does take judicial notice. Thank you. Of both. <clears throat> All right, Mr. Durst, I want to start off by I had asked you previously, you had said that um, you did not recall mentioning uh, the frisbee at all during your direct examination testimony. Mr. Milius, can you please play slide 732.5? Yes, and Your Honor, I believe our next in order is 292. 292? Yes. Yeah. And uh, 292A will be a transcript. Yeah. Um, what I remember is a little kid whether we were playing go fish or uno or frisbee or whatever, it was always mommy and Bobby against daddy and Douglas. Mr. Durst, did that refresh your recollection about the fact that you yourself referred to go fish, uno, and frisbee during your direct examination? Yes. And do you have an explanation, Mr. Durst, as to why you would have said, oh, speak, oh, thanks. Let me learn this trick. All right. It's not a trick. It's a, actually an on-off switch. Why? Well, <laughs> and I thought you didn't have your value, Mr. DeGarren. Sorry, I'm going to go over here. Yeah, I think you better. You didn't miss, you didn't miss anything. So, Mr. Durst, can, can you explain why it was that you testified to what you've now said was a vivid memory? Involved, I misspoke. Did you also misspoke about the vivid memory, which was originally your father, on two different occasions to Mr. Jarecki, and then when you got on the stand, you discussed a vivid memory of your grandfather. Can you explain that contradiction? I think I did 
see my mother on my roof, on the roof, when I was with both my grandfather and with my father. But I saw my mother close up with my grandfather when I was on the inside hall on the second floor of our house and I saw her out the window. Mr. Durst, I read for you your prior statements. Your prior statements were talking about both very clear descriptions in one, how your grandfather woke you out of bed, and the second one, how your father woke you out of bed, and then you explained how they walked you down the hallway, and the basic other information was the same, but one was your father, one was your grandfather. And my question to you is, for such a significant childhood memory, and one you've discussed frequently, can you explain why it is that when you're talking to one person, you say one thing, and when you're talking to another person, you say another? When I said my grandfather came and got me, I was stating what was correct. When I said my father came and got me, I was misspeaking. And you agree, because I read it to you twice, you didn't just misspeak once about your father getting you. You, in the second uh, quote that I mentioned from Mr. Jarecki, you discussed it again, so you misspoke twice, is that correct? Yeah. Would you further agree, Mr. Durst, would it be reasonable, as you sit here, would it be reasonable for somebody, do you think, listening to those responses, would it be reasonable for them to say, gosh, you know what, um, I think Bob Durst is lying. Mr. Durst, you also testified that you did not believe that during the March 15, 2015 interview that you had with me and detectives in New Orleans, that you had discussed the issue with the food stamps. Do you remember testifying to this basically right before uh, we had uh, the lunch break? Do you recall that? So at, at line seven, on page 74, line 18, the following exchange occurs during the 2015, March 15, 2015 interview. And I, I'm not reading the whole question, I'm interrupting in the middle. I ask you, but you'll talk about how um, you know the rules basically, how the rules do not apply. You know, um, you talk about um, VISTA. Do you know what I'm talking about? You respond, yeah. And I then say, and, and, and you'll say, um, there's a quote with Mark and Andrew that you talk about getting food stamps. And do you know what, why you did it? And you say, I did it. And I say, no, but why? What would, you had more money, you didn't need it. You say, oh, why I say I did it then? Question, well, why, why'd you do it? Um, the only thing I can think of now is why not? Question, right, you said you enjoyed beating the government. And you respond, yes. Does that now refresh your memory, Mr. Durst? Yeah. Where in that statement I just read, is there any mention by you that you had to get food stamps in order to participate in that program. 
Nowhere. Will you agree, Mr. Durst, that that last addition is something you made up as you sat up there on the witness stand trying to explain something that simply was not explainable? You got up there and you lied, correct? Uh, over it. I did not lie. Then can you explain, Mr. Durst, why it is that you were asked two separate times about this incident? Both times agreed that the reason you did it was that you enjoyed beating the government and that now you add a detail that you've never mentioned before. Can you explain that? If you can't, you can just say no. I have mentioned it before, not under oath and not to you, but I mentioned it numerous times to my wife, Debbie Charitan my friend Susie Giordano, and to the defense lawyers. Well, let's talk about Susie Giordano. At the time that she testified, you were well aware of this quote because it had been brought up at preliminary hearings. So you knew that that was a quote that had already been introduced at this trial. Is that correct? And it had also been an opening statement. Would you agree? Mr. Durst, is it your testimony that in the opening statement back in 2020 that that clip of you talking about how you got food stamps because you wanted to beat the government, are you saying that was not played to this jury? I want you to assume for a moment, Mr. Durst, that it was played. So I want you to assume that it was played. If it was played, can you think of a reason why you wouldn't have had your attorneys ask Ms. Giordano about it so she could provide the information you're now testifying to? The question is, I told you to assume that in fact that clip was played. So my question to you was, if that clip was played, can you explain why Susie Giordano, who testified only a month ago, whatever it was, how come it wasn't cleared up with her? It, you could have been done, correct? I still don't know what the question is. All right. You, you've, also, you've also brought up your wife, Deborah Cheriton. It was sustained. There's no answer. You've also brought up your wife, Deborah Cheriton. You understand, Mr. Durst, that you have a right to call her as a witness. That's up to you if you call her as a witness. You also understand that under the law, we, the people, cannot compel her to testify. So you understand that if you wanted Deborah Cheriton to testify, for what? What's the objection? Overruled. You understand, Mr. Durst, that. Objection. Yeah, what? Comment. Sidebar. So okay. Sidebar. <clears throat>
Oh, you're back. Okay. Very interesting question. <laughs> Very interesting. So you may uh, move, to, go to a different subject, and we'll and return to it. Your Honor, can I? The first issue that we discussed, I think I can ask that question. Correct. The first issue, not regarding the. Okay, well, uh, give it a try. Okay. I, I, I want you to have a different different subject. So okay, we can I can thor do that. Th thoroughly, uh, sure. We can converse more and explore okay. this to its uh, every extent. Well, dear. <clears throat> Mr. Durst, I want to talk about the New Orleans interview in 2015. Were you completely honest with Detectives Romero, Whalen, and myself during that interview? No, absolutely not. You would agree that there were times during that interview where basically you looked us right in the eye and you just bold-faced lied. Is that correct? Absolutely. And there were also times where instead of lying, you simply said that you were not going to answer a question and were going to, quote, stay away from an area of inquiry, correct? I don't remember doing that. I would not be surprised if I did. Do you remember specifically when asked some questions about where you were at the time of Susan's death, your response was, quote, I'm going to stay away from that. Does that refresh your memory at all? No, but I don't deny I said that. Now, during your interview in New Orleans, you were not under oath. Is that correct? You gave me the Miranda rule. No, correct. I was not under oath. And I just want to ask, did that make a difference? You've just said that you lied. So I just wanted to ask you, did it make a difference to you that you were not under oath when you were lying? No. Do you consider, by the way, you understand you're under oath today, is that right? I understand that, yes. And do you consider the oath that you've taken today to tell the truth, do you believe that to be a sacred oath? I believe it to be a what oath? A sacred oath. Sacred. Sacred. Sacred, are you saying? Sacred. Sacred. S-A-C-R-E-D. Sacred oath. I don't know the difference between a sacred oath and a regular oath. So what I'm basically asking you is, do you yourself personally, do you consider taking that oath where you swear to tell the truth to be something important? Yes. Would you lie under oath to help your case? Yes. Okay. Have you lied thus far during your testimony at this trial? No. But if you had lied, given your last answer, you might not admit it, correct? On direct examination, do you remember the first thing that Mr. DeGuerin asked you? He asked me if I killed Susan Berman. Did you know that question was coming? Yes. And you denied it, is that right? I said no. If, in fact, you had killed her, would you tell us? No. You were asked this exact question at two different times during the March 15, 2015 interview. Is that right? Do you remember? I don't remember. Do you remember me asking you, let's RD 329, please. This is page 51, lines 8 through 10. Well, I can tell you right away I don't remember. I'm sorry, mistress? I do not remember what happened in 2015. Right, that's why I'm going to play it right now. Thank you. If you had killed Susan, would you tell me? Does that refresh your recollection now? Yes. And so even back then, you were 
honest in the regard of basically telling us, hey, listen, if I killed her, no, I wouldn't tell you. And, and that's where you still stand today. Is that right? Correct. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that once you admit that you would lie to keep from admitting something damaging to the jury, would you agree that that pretty much destroys any credibility you would have? No. So can you explain, Mr. Durst, if you've said you've taken an oath to tell the truth, but you've also just told us that you would lie if you needed to, can you tell me how that would not destroy your credibility? It would not destroy my credibility because what I'm saying is mostly the truth. There are certain things that I would lie about, certain very important things. So maybe another way to say it, Mr. Durst, is would you agree that the question of did you kill Susan Berman is the most important question in this trial? I would agree with that. And you've also just agreed that you would lie about that. Correct. And you've also just agreed that, in fact, if you had killed her, you wouldn't tell us, correct? Correct. So given that that's the case, would you agree then that for every important issue in this case, Mr. Durst, in essence, you've just said you're not to be believed. That's No. C can you explain why you say no? And if you can't, you can just say I can't explain it. Susan Berman is strictly a hypothetical. I did not kill Susan Berman, but if I had, I would lie about it. So, for the jury who's trying to assess A, what happened in this case, and B, what your credibility is, I'm just trying to understand, haven't you just told them with that answer that in essence, they can't believe anything you say about anything important? You were asked the same question March 15, 2015 with respect to Kathy Durst. Do you recall being asked, if you had killed Kathy, would you tell me? I don't recall. RD 328, 315, 15, page 51, lines 5 through 6. And Your Honor, this is also part of People's 291, the <coughs> March 15, 2015 interview. Thank you. I want to, you know, and I'm going to just ask this straight out. If you, if you had killed Kathy, would you tell me? No. Does that refresh your memory? It does. And Mr. Durst, if I were to ask you right now, if you had killed Kathy, and I asked you, Mr. Durst, you're under oath right now today, did you kill Kathy, would you tell us? No. Let me ask you, Mr. Durst, if you had murdered Morris Black, would you tell us? No. All right, let's talk about some other areas of untruthfulness. Is it fair to say that you're someone who lies a lot? No. Is it fair to say that you're somebody who lies a lot when it is something important that might get you into trouble? No. Can you explain to me, Mr. Durst, I've just asked you 
three questions about whether you would be truthful, and you've just said that even though you're under oath, if in fact the information was that you had killed Susan or killed Kathy or murdered Morris or all three, that you would lie, can you tell me then how that would not be characteristic of somebody who lies a lot? Those are the three things that I would lie about. There are very few things that I would lie about. Well, it's fair to say that, that with, in the context of this case, you'll lie about anything that you believe is a threat to get you convicted, correct? No. So you have a list of things you will lie about on this trial, but it's only three things, and then the rest of the things you'll be truthful? Is that what you're telling us? Well, I don't know what else I'll be asked. Okay. Um, do you agree that when it is in your interest not to tell the truth, that you have a history of simply lying? No. So I'm going to go through this more in detail, but as an example, um, you lied to Mike Strzok when you said that gave your alibi of having drinks with the mayors. That was a lie, correct? Correct. And you lied because you felt that it was in your best interest to do so, correct? I lied because I felt he wanted me to have gone someplace after dropping Kathy off at the train station. But in addition, Mr. Durst, you lied because you believed that that lie advanced the narrative you wanted and minimized the narrative that you had killed your wife, correct? That lie encouraged Mike Strzok to open a missing person case for Kathy Durst. So you're saying that that wasn't a lie to try to help yourself, that was a lie to try to help the investigation to find your missing wife? Is that your testimony? Yes. By the way, if what you just told me was untrue, would you admit it? Yes. Can I ask Mr. Durst, if someone is trying to assess your credibility, and you've just indicated three things you would lie about in this trial, can you explain how would somebody assess Bob Durst's credibility when you've already mentioned certain things you would lie about and now you're saying certain things you won't lie about? How does somebody figure out which is which? The same way they figure out which is which during their regular lives. Meaning they, they look at what makes sense. So would you agree that if somebody tells you they're going to lie under oath about important issues, you would agree, Mr. Durst, that person probably should not be believed, correct? No. Please explain your answer. Well, lots of people tell lies. That doesn't mean you disbelieve everything else they say. Is it fair, though, that if somebody is telling lies about potentially three murders, that it would be fair to disbelieve anything else they say that relates to those three murders? Would, would that be a fair statement? No. Okay, let, let me move on. Um, in the past, have you stated that just because you lie a lot doesn't mean you're good at it? Maybe, I don't know. So I'll give you the option, Mr. Durst, because it's quicker. I can read you the transcript, or I can play the clip. Do you have a preference for which I do? No. Okay, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read transcripts to go faster on some of these. Okay. Let me play RD 601, 12, 13, 10, lines 21 through 23. Yeah. I mean, I'm 
told lies all my life, but nobody ever said, Bob, you're a real good liar. Is it your testimony that you did not remember, not just saying that, but you don't remember that being kind of a guiding description of how you lived your life? I don't remember saying that, and it is not a guiding description of how I live my life. So when you said in this clip, I've told lies all my life, can you explain how that can mean anything other than I've told lies all my life? I was following a script prepared by Andrew Jurecki. Okay, let me just be clear on this. So now it's a script you were given. It's not just hints. He literally had a script and you were reading it? Script is the wrong word. Hints are the right word. Hints was Andrew's word. He said, I'm going to give you hints. You have to put it in your own words. You're aware, Mr. Durst, that all of this was filmed, correct? Yes. You're aware that your lawyers have all the film we do, correct? I assume they do. Well, so Mr. Durst, wouldn't, if that were true, then wouldn't we expect that you'd be showing right now, look, here's Andrew Jarecki telling me what to say. Andrew Jarecki told me what to say in telephone conversations before I gave interviews on Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, the 11th, 12th, and 13th of 2010. So he specifically told you, hey, Bob, make sure you say, I've told lies all my life, but then add the part, but nobody ever said, Bob, you're a real good liar. You're saying that those are his words, not yours? Yes. Well, you, can you tell me, Mr. Durst? Does that sound almost like kind of a Bobism? Does that sound like the way you talk? Does what sound like the way I talk? I mean, I've told all lies all my life, but nobody ever said, Bob, you're a real good liar. Does that sound like the way you talk? No. All right. You told Detective Strzok, again, in February of 82, that you had, uh, allegedly had drinks at the train, I'm sorry, had drinks with uh, Bill Mayer after you dropped off Kathy at the train, is that correct? Yeah. And eventually, when you ended up getting caught at it years later, you said, and these are your words, that you were not used to people questioning your veracity. Can you explain what you mean by that? I think it means what it says. Those words are all little words. If there's one of them you're having a problem with, I'm sure you could look it up on some app or other. Are these questions getting under your skin a little bit? No. So, Mr. Durst, what you meant, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you're used to, in your world, of saying whatever you want to say, and nobody really questions it. That's how your life is gone, correct? I don't think my life is gone. Well, now I have difficulty with the question. I've lived my life and I'm not used to having people question me. So, you agree that the issue of your lying came up with Andrew Jarecki during both your 2010 and 2012 interviews, correct? Correct. And you're now admitting that, hey, you repeatedly lied during those interviews, correct? Yes. And you're saying among the big lies, would you agree, was everything you said about not having traveled to Los Angeles in December 2020 and all of your repeated statements that you did not write the cadaver note. Is that correct?
I think there's a typo. It says not traveling to Los Angeles in 2020. Oh, you know what? There isn't, yeah, there is a typo in my, uh, thank you. So among the big lies that you've told was about not having traveled to Los Angeles in That's December. Not a typo. You misspoke. No, no, it's a typo in my outline. And Excellent. then I misspoke both. It's very clear. The record is correct. Yeah, yeah no, that's not what I meant. It's John's mistake. Yeah, my mistake. Absolutely. Twice. Writing it down and then speaking about it. So let me repeat my question, Mr. Durst. Among the big lies was everything you said about not having traveled to Los Angeles in December of 2000 and all of your repeated statements that you did not write the cadaver note. Is that correct? Correct. What was uh, that? I'll, I'll allow it. Do you, Compound, I'll allow it. do you recall Mr. Jarecki asking you, in essence, about whether you were lying during the interviews and you adamantly denying you would ever do that in response? Do you recall that? No, I don't recall it. RD 565, 12, 13, 10, page 628, lines 5 through 25. Your Honor, may we mark this as Peoples 294 and 294A? Yes. And we know that you're comfortable lying when it's appropriate. Yes. Um, you do it pretty convincingly, and that you do it very quickly, um, and that you lie to the police without hesitation. Are you lying to me right now? No. What would prevent you from lying to me? I wouldn't do this, so I thought I'd have to lie to you. Why is that? Why do it? I can't think of any reason to come here and try to get away with a lie. First, there's a real good chance that you would conclude I'm a liar and that whatever you do would, would, would say I spoke to him for whatever, whatever, and he's clearly lying to me. Um, yeah, there, there would be a bad idea. I'd be creating something which could go very, very wrong. Mr. Durst, is it correct that literally Andrew Jarecki asked you how does he know whether you're lying during these interviews? And you told him, I would never lie during these interviews because you would catch me and it could go very, very wrong. But isn't it true? That's exactly what you were doing. You were repeatedly lying during those interviews, correct? Correct. And you were repeatedly lying to Mr. Jarecki when you told him you would never lie during those interviews, correct? Correct. And would you agree that the one thing that was truthful that you seem to say in that little excerpt was that it would be a bad idea because you'd be creating something which could go very, very wrong. Do you agree that it's gone very, very wrong? My interview of Jarecki. Your interview of Jarecki and the things that you've said that are now coming back to haunt you on cross-examination. Pardon me, form. Uh, form. Um, it's okay. compound. Sure. Compound. Would you agree, Mr. Durst, that what you did, the statements that you've said, have come back to basically bite you, not just with Mr. Jarecki, but in your trial here. I would agree that everything I did with Mr. Jarecki was a mistake. Would you agree that to successfully lie requires some effort to keep track of what you previously said? I don't know. Well, you would agree, Mr. Durst, that if you're going to lie, and if you're going to have some complicated lies, that you need to keep track of those lies yourself, right? Is that a fair statement? I guess. Would you agree that keeping track, expending effort, keeping track of your own lies is not one of your strong points? I don't agree or disagree. Well, isn't it true, Mr. Durst, that the reason you've been caught in so many of your lies is that they're just not very good? Well, you bring up the cadaver, though. And I had to lie about the cadaver note, 
because anyone who saw the cadaver know would have to believe that I was with Susan Berman when she died. Well, it's worse than that, Mr. Durst. You previously said on multiple occasions that, quote, that's a note only the killer could have written. Correct? That's what Andrew asked me to say. That, that's another thing that Mr. Jarecki asked you to say. Did he ask you to say it when you were speaking to me as well in 2015? Well, he asked me to say it once, and I repeated it. So, seriously? Sustain. No, no, ask, ask, follow up. Right. Mr. Durst, so your position is that Mr. Jarecki told you to say an incredibly incriminating statement. Do you agree that's an incredibly incriminating statement when you know at the time you're saying it, even though it has been proven, you know you wrote the cadaver note, correct? I knew I wrote the cadaver note, correct. And, and you, I just want to make sure you weren't having some kind of, let's see, Jack Daniels, or Percocet, or marijuana, or crystal meth high when you made that statement, correct? You knew. Which time I made the statement? I no. made the statement repeatedly. No, I'm asking you, Mr. Durst, that in essence, that's a statement when you made it. You knew when you were, as you were making the statement, you know what, I'm saying whoever wrote the cadaver note has to be the killer. And I know, I'm not forgetting, I'm not delusional. I know I wrote the cadaver note, right? Correct. Why would you make a statement like that then? Because Andrew asked me to. So, when you were interviewed by myself and detectives in the prison in Louisiana, did you consider that to be a pretty important interview? No. You did not? Well, it went nowhere. I was right. It went nowhere. You were right. Is that what you said? Correct. So do, do you believe that you said many, many incriminating things during that interview? Yeah. So my question to you would be, why on earth would it matter what Andrew Jarecki said to you three or four or five years prior? that would lead you to say those things to a deputy district attorney and two LAPD homicide detectives. Can you explain that? Because I was working on a plea bargain. You were, wait, you were working on a plea bargain? I was making a deal with you to get me out of Louisiana. Did, by the way, did you ever mention anything about you needed to get out of Louisiana during that interview? I think I made it clear that I was ready to do a plea bargain. Well, Mr. Durst, are you aware, you, listen, this isn't your first rodeo regarding being charged in a criminal case, correct? Do you understand what I mean by that? That's more of a, a question for Mr. DeGuerin. He could probably tell you. Do you understand what the expression, it's not your first rodeo, means? I don't understand the expression. So. It's not your first rodeo means that, in essence, hey, you're not somebody who all of a sudden, for the first time in 2015, is being questioned by a prosecutor and homicide detectives and has never had any exposure to the criminal justice system. By 2015, you'd already been charged and acquitted of murder, plus you'd had other uh, various contacts as well. So what I'm basically saying is you were aware of how things worked back in 2015, correct? Well, I obviously was wrong because I thought you would do a plea bargain with me. Well, so, Mr. Durst, did you not say at the end of the interview that you wanted to speak to your lawyers before you did anything? At the end of the interview, I told you I would be willing to continue the interview after court. But my lawyer showed up during court, and after court, 
I told you in my lawyer's presence that I did not want to, to go ahead with the interview. Mr. Durst, who brought up during our interview? Which one of us brought up the issue of if I tell you what I know, what can you do for me? Did I bring that up or was that you bringing that up? I brought it up several times. So, Mr. Durst, you're a wealthy man with very high paid lawyers and you're telling me that you came in to have this interview with me and you decided, apparently without ever saying it, that you were going to plea bargain a case that had not been charged yet? Um, yeah, I want you to rephrase it well, and be, be, be I'll, clean. I'll rephrase it. Mr. Durst, you were aware that at the time you were interviewed, charges had not been filed against you yet. I was not aware until a good part after that. I think charges had been filed against me, Your Honor, but court, I did not know about it. You know, will the court take judicial notice that charges in this case were not filed until after the interview? Yes. Mr. Durst, you were told specifically during that interview. There's a, a warrant. I'm sorry. There was a complaint for arrest. There was an arrest warrant. Arrest warrant, but no charges, Your Honor. Correct. Mr. Durst, you were told during that interview that it was voluntary if you spoke to us, correct? Several times. And isn't it true, Mr. Durst, that what I urged you to do was to tell you to tell the truth? And did I not tell you repeatedly that, Mr. Durst, I, I can't offer you anything? You definitely did not tell me repeatedly that you could not offer me anything. So it's your, it's your belief that you and I were having plea bargains on a case that had not been filed, is that? This is your thing was not being filed. My whole experience in Orleans was being told stuff that was misleading. When I was arrested, I said I was arrested. I was under arrest. The FBI agent said, you're not under arrest. The FBI agent handcuffed me to a table and continued to say that I was not under arrest. Now, this whole question of whether I've been charged or not been charged, I was obvious to me that if I had not been charged, I was going to be charged. And this is legal language. So your position was that even though you're a non-lawyer and a wealthy man that you decided to engage in plea negotiations with a lawyer during your first interview instead of having your attorneys do it. That's your position? I thought if I made a deal with this person, this person would go ahead and stick to the deal. What was the deal you were trying to get? I was trying to get out of Louisiana. Well, Mr. Durst, isn't it true that what you proposed, you proposed was, if I tell you about Susan and about where Kathy is, what can you do for me? That's a paraphrase of what you said, correct? Over. I remember that was at the very end of the interview, and I spoke very carefully. I said that if we made a plea bargain, and I wanted to make Ann McCormick happy, that I would have to say, what happened to Kathy? At no point did I say that I knew what happened to Kathy. <laughs> Mr. Durst, how could you say what happened to Kathy if you didn't know what happened to Kathy? I was speaking in your kind of language. If we make a plea bargain, you're going to want to know what happened to Kathy. That is different 
from me saying that I know what happened to Kathy and I don't know what happened to Kathy. So let me understand this. So what you're saying is you were trying to make a plea bargain where you offer to say what happened to Kathy and what happened to Susan, but in the end, you didn't know what happened to Kathy or Susan, so how are you ever going to be able to make a plea bargain, Mr. Durst? A rule. A rule. Well, back then, it seemed like if I kept If I said enough, can't find the word, enough. The word lie? Is that the word you're looking for? No. Incriminating. If I said enough incriminating things, this DA from Los Angeles would figure out that I wanted to make a plea bargain. But if, Mr. Durst, if you're telling me that you're proposing that you wanted to make Ann McCormick happy, and if you're proposing as a part of some plea deal you are negotiating, then wouldn't you have to, Mr. Durst, have the knowledge of what happened to Kathy in order to fulfill your side of the deal? No. But p please explain how that would work. I'm not understanding. Well, I'm not exactly sure how it would work. And you never took any of the bait anyway. At no point did you say, well, if you do this, this, and this, I will agree to try to help you do this, this, and this. At some point, I said to you, I diagnosed with having five years left to live. So that means unless you can give me more life, you're going to have to come up with something that I'm happy with now. I'm going to go on to another area, Mr. Durst. Um, have you ever lied under oath before? Yes. Fair to say, you've repeatedly lied under oath. Is that correct? That's incorrect. Well, haven't you done it in prior sworn testimony and in prior sworn affidavits, correct? Incorrect. Okay. Have you previously lied in prior sworn testimony? Yes. Have you previously lied in prior sworn affidavits? I would have to know what kind of affidavit we're talking about. Well, I'm going to get there. Remember. Okay. How about this one? February 7th, 1983, you filed an affidavit with the Surrogate Court of New York. Do you remember that affidavit? No. Great. Let's put it up. You want to mark this? Yes. People's next in order, please. 295. It's a five-page document. 295. Uh, you've displayed it to... No, it's in discovery. Well, no, display it to him before you project it. Bates number 134069 to 134074, counsel. Yeah, he needs to show them, you need to show them the actual document and then orient them to the document and then project it if there's no objection. Okay. 
Mr. Gertz, rather than have you read this five-page document, what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to go through and I'm going to ask you, do you recall filing a response to, to a petition by Kathy's mother in January of 1983 where she was attempting to be named as the administrator of Kathy's property? So this is about a year after Kathy disappeared. Do you recall that? I do recall it. And at the time, the value of Kathy's property was a very small amount, not more than twenty-five or 30000 is that it sound about right? I thought they said it was fifty thousand. You know what? It, 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 would you agree, Mr. Durst, that it is then fifty thousand or below? It's not worth going through. Just it's just to you, fifty thousand dollars is not a large amount of money, correct? Fifty thousand dollars is a great deal of money. What's that? Sidebar. Okay. All right. $50,000 is a large amount of money. Didn't you testify yesterday that it was a small amount of money? He's asked for a side Oh, I didn't hear. I'm sorry. Your Honor, before you go back, I, I did say there was five pages. It, it's actually six pages. Just Thank you. Us. Six pages. You may proceed, Mr. Lewin. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Gertz, is that your signature? Yes. So, isn't it true, Mr. Durst, that Mary Hughes had filed an affidavit, and then in your response, you said that almost without exception, no statement in the affidavit of Mary Hughes is true. That was your response, correct? <laughs> You're asking me to remember that? Okay. Uh, we'll, if, we'll, it's, if it's up there, that's my response. Number four, almost without exception, no statement in the affidavit of Mary Hughes is true. Do you see yeah, that? Yeah, I see that. Okay. You further said, I have not disposed of any of Kathy's belongings or personal property, and the allegations made to the contrary in Mary Hughes' affidavit are false. That was a lie, correct? That was true. Mr. Durst, you had already thrown her stuff out more than a year before. You'd thrown it out from... Riverside uh, from uh, East 86th Street, testimony from Karen Minatello. You'd thrown it out from South Salem, testimony um, from uh, Elizabeth, Jones. Elizabeth Jones. Karen Minutello never ever told me anything about finding Kathy's belongings in the basement. That's all I'm asking you. Is it your testimony, Mr. Durst, that you did not dispose of any of Kathy's property? Correct. That is my testimony. And you heard the testimony of Elizabeth Jones where she testified that you told her to make a junk run and basically get rid of all this stuff from South Salem. Is it your position that that was untrue? Yes. I never told Liz Jones she should throw out anything. All I told her was that Kathy gave the sewing machine to Janet Fink, who has not picked it up, so therefore you, Liz Jones, can have the sewing machine. If you had thrown out Kathy's property, if you had disposed of it, would you tell us today? Yes. So I'm just trying to understand. So you've said before, and you've indicated things you would lie about, but this one you said, no, I would tell you the truth. Why would you tell the truth about that, but admit, yeah, I'd lie about these other things? Overruled. Well, I did not throw out Kathy's things, so that is the truth. 
So you also said in this affidavit. D, it's on the report. That the, she related in her affidavit the Christmas party incident, which you have now admitted occurred. And you said that was false. Do you know what I'm referring to? I know what you're referring to. But you there have been about a dozen different descriptions of what happened at the Christmas party. You said that there was, all right, let, <laughs> let's keep going. Um, you swore under penalty of perjury that Kathy had made up allegations of physical abuse. And you said that she had lied about that. Is that correct? I don't know what it is I said she lied about. I don't know what you're talking about. I never threatened her life or threatened her in any way or assaulted Kathy or caused her any physical harm or abuse. That's a lie, correct? That's true. You never assaulted your wife? Correct. Mr. Durst, you've testified to incidents involving assault of your wife. I did not. When you grab her by the hair, Mr. Durst, is that an assault? That's the Christmas party. Some people said I grabbed her by the hair. Other people said I grabbed her by her coat. No, the only person who says you grabbed her by the coat, Mr. Durst, is you. I Name me one other person who says you grabbed her by the coat. Do you know, Mr. Durst, of another individual who Tom has... Tom Hughes. Tom... Tom Hughes. Yes, Catholic. Mary Hughes' husband, Tom Hughes, said I grabbed her by the coat. And do you have a statement from Mr. Hughes that says that, Mr. Durst? I think you interviewed him and he said that. Well, then I assume, Mr. Durst, you'll, you'd be calling Mr. Hughes to testify to that because it would apparently impeach this alleged assault on your wife at Christmas, correct? Thank you, Mr. Chief. Follow the question. Uh, I'll withdraw the question. All right. So, Mr. Durst, it's your position that the things that I pointed out to you, none of those things you said are untrue. Is that correct? The things you pointed out to me in the affidavit are true are correct and are true. I want to ask you, if in fact, Mr. Durst, you had threatened or assaulted Kathy, would you have said so in this affidavit? I think I would have been silent about it in the affidavit. So you're saying, so you'll lie in a courtroom under oath, you've said, on certain issues, but you're saying you wouldn't lie in an affidavit, you would be silent, is that correct? Is that correct? But I did not ever assault Kathy. What happened at the Christmas party, no one would consider to be an assault. Mr. Durst. Yeah. Okay, let's let's go ahead here. Let me let me find it. One moment. Do you have the do you have the clip, please, of the statement about the hair pulling from to Jarecki and Smirling. It also says in this affidavit that you and Kathy had never discussed divorce. No paragraph 4E, Your Honor. Do you see that? No, I don't see it. Where does it say that? At, where it says E, at no time did Kathy and I discuss divorce. Isn't that a straight lie? Well, when you discuss the 
it implies we never talked about getting a divorce. We never talked about numbers. We never discussed. Yeah, we never talked about getting a divorce. All right, let, let me just ask you very plainly. Is the statement, at no time did Kathy and I discuss divorce, is that a true or a false statement? It's a true statement. And you believe it's a true statement, even though you've testified on direct examination about lawyers that you both had, about letters back and forth. You've been questioned about settlement negotiations with your wife. There were no questions about settling. Let me let, let me move on. So, uh, let's go to one second. R D zero four seven. Is that document evidence? It has not been admitted yet, but it's, it's been, been identified. It, it, Was it admitted earlier? No, no. It, no. We'll we'll move to admit it. We're not doing it yet, but but we right. are. We will be doing so. Yes, of course. Thank you. Um, this is going to be RD047. This is from 12-11-2010, page 30, line 21, to page 31, line 4. She was doing bad in school and gotten a whole bunch of incompletes and I was under the impression that she wasn't sure she was going to graduate. This is close. After a number of years before I would go to her family's house for a function, I would insist that uh, we agree on how long we're going to stay. Two hours, three hours, four hours, we would always do a negotiation. When the time was up, I was ready to leave. Seen the story about the hair two different ways. One way, I drag her out of the house by her hair. The other way, I grab her hair and a big chunk comes out. Either one is close enough. Do you recall saying that? I do. Is that going to be another thing where Mr. Jarecki told you to say that? Yes. And in that statement, Mr. Durst, in any way, at any point, did you say, no, that's wrong. I pulled her out of the house by the hat and coat. Did you say that? In that statement, no. Have you ever said, Mr. Durst, to any reporter, to any police officer, in any courtroom, prior to the other day, that, no, you didn't pull Kathy's hair, you pulled the coat and the hat? I think that's in my affidavit. Which affidavit? Well, I don't know which affidavit. There are many of them. So, Mr. Durst, you just heard your statement. And do you agree that what you just said simply said that there were two versions? One, you pulled her out of the house by the hair. And two, you pulled her out by the hair and a big clump fell out. That's what you said, correct? That's what's in the movie, correct? No, that's not what's in the movie. That's what you said, correct? Those are your words. That wasn't Ryan Gosling. That was you, correct? Oh, and that was what Andrew wanted me to say. And that's what Andrew had Ryan Gosling say. So, Mr. Durst, when you watch that video, how does it make you feel when you watch it? I thought it was a bad movie. No, Mr. Durst, I wasn't asking you to assess the movie. I'm asking you about the image of you pulling your wife out of a house by her hair. Does that make any impact on you at all? No. Do you feel remorseful? I did not pull her out of the house by the hair, 
So I have nothing to feel remorseful about. So you told me that Andrew Jarecki told you to say that. Is that correct? Correct. Did you also discuss the same issue when I interviewed you? you recall? Is there a question for me? Yes. Did you discuss the hair pulling incident when I interviewed you in 2015? I don't remember. If you would have discussed it with me in 2015, would you agree you would have told me, hey listen, that's wrong. I didn't pull her out of the house by the hair. She was wearing a hat. I don't know what I would have said in 2015. Well, Mr. Durst, wouldn't you want to make clear that that was wrong and that, in fact, you had not done what you said you had done in the interview with Mr. Jarecki? In 2015, I was trying to do a plea bargain with you, and I would have said all kinds of things. I don't really think... What you're saying about it being an assault was relevant. I want to I want to play what you said during your trial, during direct examination, RD seven zero two, and I want you to tell me during my trial, this trial, RD seven zero two. And that movie that you watched with um, Jarecki, there's a scene where uh, the person that is supposed to be you grabs the person that's supposed to be Kathy and drags her out of the place in front of her parents. Did that happen that way or not? That was close. I've seen that described three or four different ways by three or four different people. In one scene, I grabbed Kathy by her hair and dragged her out of the house like a caveman or something. Did you do that? No, I did not do that. I did grab Kathy's hat, put it on Kathy's head, grab Kathy's coat, and push her towards the door. Mr. Durst, who are those three or four different people who described it three or four different ways? The distinction that you're making is that Mary Hughes in the affidavit said not that you pulled her out of the house by the hair, but that apparently you pulled the hair so hard that a clump of it fell out. I think that's what Mary Hughes said, yes. Did Mary you just did Mary Hughes ever say, Mr. Durst, that you put a hat on Kathy and then pulled her out by the hat and the coat? No, Mary Hughes never said that. Now, Mr. Well, to my knowledge. Now, Mr. Durst, I want you to assume that you had committed. Do you agree that what was portrayed on the screen, do you find that to be a violent and offensive act? 
Slightly. Slightly. Okay. Can can you explain why only slightly? Well, a violent act would be if the other person got hurt, and in that thing directly that you just showed, Ryan Gosling pulls Crew, whatever her name is, Karen Dunst, out of the house, sits her down in her automobile, and she's fine. Well, Mr. Durst, you agree that when you're assessing kind of slightly, you're kind of comparing that to murder, something else you're familiar with, correct? I am not comparing it to murder. Well, you said... I just want to ask you, Mr. Durs, forgetting about whether you think that's accurate, I just want to ask you, when you watch that, and it's a scene of somebody, you, violently attacking their wife in front of her family and pulling her out of the house by her hair, you only find that, quote, slightly disturbing? Well, the movie goes on. They get into the car, and they have a conversation, and they drive away. She's obviously not hurt. So, would you agree, Mr. Durst, that this is a significant enough incident that the issue is not that you forget what happened? In other words, you're not saying, I don't remember whether I pulled her out by the hair. You're saying, I did not pull her out by the hair. My memory is that I pulled her out by the coat and the hat. Is that your testimony? Yes. And you would agree, though, that this is not the kind of thing that you're going to forget or mix up, correct? Correct. Now, isn't... Thank you. Isn't it true, Mr. Durst, that you really don't find this incident disturbing because to you, Kathy was wrong because she hadn't gotten out of the house when you thought she should leave and you took action that you found to be appropriate, correct? And Kathy was not injured in any way, just like Christian Dunst was not injured in the movie. They went on and had a conversation. Let me ask you something. What do you think it must be like for somebody to be pulled out of the house by their hair, by their husband, in front of their family? Do you not think that that would be one of the most horrific things that could happen to somebody outside of some violent attack where they're hurt? <laughs> I think my answer, I think a horrific thing would be if Gertrude Dunst was hurt. She wasn't hurt. Ryan Gosling slammed the door after she was pushed into the car, they drove away talking to one another. So whatever it was that got her out of the house it was not, it did not injure her. You understand that Ryan Gossie and Kirsten Dunst, they were actors, right? You understand that, right? I understand that. You understand that Kathy Durst was a real person, correct? Correct. And you understand that Kathy Durst disappeared 40 years ago, correct? I don't think it's 40 years ago. I think it's 39 years ago. Yes, thank you for pointing out that distinction, Mr. Durst. My Thir pleasure. 39 years ago. Correct. So, let me ask you something. You were asked about your response to this incident during your December 12, 2010 interview with Mr. Jarecki. RD050, page 220, line 6 to page 221, line 20. After this clip, Your Honor, the break would work. It works for the court. Exhibit number?
297. I, I think that's actually one of your previous Here's Steve Hart. Thank yeah. you. So, I have the easy job. I just call out the number and Mr. Milius finds it. For like a period. <laughs> <laughs> it was previously marked as people's 269 and we, it was pages uh, 20 through 21. Thank you. We went inside and grabbed Kathy. Time to go, let's go. And we talked about the various stories about that. Tell me what you remember about going back in there. And I remember grabbing her by her hair and grabbing her arm and getting her coat. And we're, we're going. And um, the grabbing her by her hair part, how did that enter your mind? Or, or, or I, I went back in to get Kathy. Kathy, it's time to go. Well, just another, no, we're going. And with, from your standpoint, was it that you were, you know, you were pissed off, you were angry? Yes, I was pissed off. She agreed to leave after a certain period of time, and now she's not doing it. She's wrong. I'm right. Let's go. Um, and you described that there were a couple of theories about whether you pulled her by her hair, whether a chunk yeah, yeah, of her hair. Yeah, I pulled a chunk of her hair out, and I, I, I remember grabbing her by the coat and, and her arm and the hair. And whether her hair came out or not, I don't know, but I dragged her out of the house. Do you remember the feeling of, uh, of that happening as we're sitting here? Do you remember the, the, the feeling of walking into the house, of going to get her? Does that... Yes, yeah, total anger. We're not doing this. With me being the dominant one, if we agree on two hours, it's going to be two hours not going to be two and a half hours or two hours and 20 minutes. It's time to go. You agreed to go. Let's go. The same thing with having a child. You agreed that we weren't going to have children. You got yourself pregnant. You want to get an abortion? You can get an abortion. You want to have the child? You're going to get divorced. Thank you. Thank you, Ladies and gentlemen, do not converse among yourselves with anyone else in any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case 330.